Now that we've talked about the problem of noisy data, we'll consider two other common types of data problems, baseline problems and eye artifacts. Let's start with baseline problems. Ideally, ERP waveforms will be perfectly flat during the pre-stimulus period, like this. Of course, real waveforms always have noise, more like this. A lot of waveforms have a clear tilt in the baseline period, like this. It might be overlapping activity from the previous stimulus, or it might be preparatory activity if the subjects knew that a stimulus is about to appear. But the tilt in the baseline is usually more subtle and somewhat obscured by noise, like this. As we discussed in a previous video, a tilt in the baseline is not always a problem. If two conditions have the same tilt, it's still valid to compare the difference between them. To make sure that the tilt is the same, it helps to use experimental designs where the stimuli for the different conditions are randomly intermixed rather than being presented in separate blocks of trials. For example, the targets and singletons in Rhesus studied appeared in random order. This means that subjects couldn't differentially prepare for the targets and for the singletons, and the baselines for the targets and the singletons should be the same. However, if the different conditions are in different blocks of trials, or you're comparing different groups of subjects, the preparatory activity or overlap may differ between the waveforms. So whenever you look at ERP waveforms, you should look closely at the baseline to see if the tilt is different for the waveforms being compared. Because of baseline correction, differences in tilt will often result in differences between conditions starting around time zero. So if you see an effect that begins unrealistically early and persists for a long time, you should suspect differences in overlap or preparatory activity. And then, if you take a close look at the methods section, you'll probably see that there's some kind of problem with the experimental design that led to differential preparation or differential overlap. Now let's move on to blinks and eye movements. Remember, each eye contains a powerful dipole that's positive in the front and negative in the back. When the eyes move, you get a change in the orientation of the dipole, which changes the voltage field on the scalp. And if the subject blinks, the movement of the eyelids over this dipole causes a huge voltage deflection on the scalp, negative under the eyes and positive above the eyes. Blinks are huge and easy to detect, and you can also correct for them using ICA. So most studies don't have differences in blink-related activity between conditions or between groups. But if you see an effect that's biggest at the very front of the head, and you suspect that blinks are the reason, you should look at the data from under the eyes. If the experimental effect is blink-related, the polarity of the effect will be opposite under versus over the eyes. Eye movements are a more difficult problem, especially in experiments with lateralized stimuli like N2PC and CDA experiments. As I described in an earlier video, lateral eye movements produce lateralized voltage fields on the scalp, with a more negative voltage contralateral to the target of the eye movement, just like an N2PC. But eye movements produce a more frontal scalp distribution than the N2PC or CDA, but they can still produce a statistically significant contralateral negativity over the posterior electrodes where we look at the N2PC. If you look at the methods section of Reese's paper, you'll see that she very carefully ruled out eye movements. I don't have time to describe her methodology here, but there's a detailed description in my ERP book.